House dinners were major social events as they still are in co-ops today. Formal and informal dances and parties were held regularly to celebrate the season or the holidays. House journals and scrapbooks tell of a group of women engaged in a friendly and perpetual competition of wit and creativity. But as the years progressed, the house became more similar to a sorority in its activities, even having a hell week for initiation of new members. The heritage of Tabard Inn presents a challenge to you. What you learn about cooperative living here will enable you to make a home anywhere. The cooperative spirit is an everyday spirit, one that must be lived each day. It means doing your best, doing your house job the way you really know it should be done, keeping Tabard as charming and welcoming as your own home. After all, that was 62 years ago. And, and the more I thought about it, I thought, my gosh, that was the name of the co-op I lived in when I was a freshman. <laughs> Orchard Street. I can't remember how this was arranged that I would stay at uh, Tabard Inn. I kind of suspect that my parents thought that it would be a good place for me to eat and live so I would have proper nutrition. Well, see, this was still a depression, and uh, the big, big theme in life was keeping body and soul together, really. Yeah. And uh, politics, I don't remember any uh, political discussions whatsoever. Of course, we were young, naive girls. I think 18-year-olds I think now are much more sophisticated than they were then. There was a dining room, and uh, uh, for that many people, all I remember is one large table. And it was nicely set, nice meals. Uh, and I, I suppose we took turns waiting on table and doing the dishes and all that sort of thing. It was just the way we grew up. We always did that sort of thing. So you just carried it over into your, your co-op living situation. In 1920, a faculty member named Mary Anderson and a friend found a bunch of furniture left over from the first co-op houses in the attic of Lather Paul. Anderson thought the furniture could be used in a new co-op house. Two students were interested in the idea and got a group of women together to live in the house. So began Anderson House, the second women's co-op in Madison at that time. Shortly after its beginning, the house was demolished for university expansion and the co-op moved to a house on Langdon, where it stayed for a few years before in 1928 settling into a house at 228 North Charter. This house was bought for them by the UWBC. I think Anderson was mostly looking for um, a good living quarters run on a cooperative basis. It gave us a lifestyle that was, uh, was very positive. So it was good for us, I think. There were some of us who, some in the house that had they been in a better financial position, they may have preferred to go to a sorority. I remember one of my friends saying that. To get to live in a cooperative house meant a great deal and how much it would cost to uh, go to the university. 20 women, I would say we got along of just about like any other 20 women, sometimes good and sometimes not well at all. The so women students <clears throat> that lived there uh, had some say and we would, we had, uh, I think we always had our house meeting on Monday night and 10.30 uh, Monday night we had to be for that and that was compulsory and at that time uh, we uh, made decisions in the areas that we were allowed to make decisions. Now those areas are very different from today. Of course in the 1940s the women had to be in at a certain hour, 10.30, 10.30 during the week and 12.30 on the weekends. And of course it was not co-ed. Uh, co in fact, uh, it was very unusual if we ever, uh, if a man was ever allowed on second and third floor. <laughs> 
During the early 1920s, there was a boom in women's co-ops in Madison. In 1921, Charter House was started at 428 North Charter, after Dean Narden asked various students if they wanted to set up a co-op. For a time, Charter was the home of the future wife of Harold Groves, a longtime co-op activist in Madison. Fallows House was formed in 1924 at 921 University Avenue. A senior named Norma Schoen got together a group of women interested in starting a co-op. The house was named in honor of Bishop Fallows, who was among the first to urge admittance of women at the UW. Shortly after Fallows was formed, another co-op, Catherine Cleveland House, was started. This house was named after an alumnus who supported the women's co-ops. Houses for these new co-ops were eventually bought by the UWBC. By the time of the Depression in the late 20s and early 30s, the three newer houses were already in decline. A letter from alumnus Mrs. Groves told of how Charter was having trouble keeping going because of a lack of interest in the house. By the late 30s, the three newer co-ops had been dissolved. Only Tabard and Anderson survived. They went on to thrive until the early 60s when the university dissolved them, much to the discontent of their members, to start new co-op dorms. It's surprising that the women's co-ops would decline during the Depression since normally co-ops thrive during times of economic crisis. In fact, to match the decline in the women's co-ops, there was a boom in fraternity-like men's co-ops. It's probable that the Depression brought a decline in the enrollment of women in the university as back then sending a daughter to college was more a luxury than a necessity. It was assumed a woman would marry and be a housewife. Many of the women were going to college to take home ec, not to take chemistry or ag sciences. On the other hand, the Depression made it harder for families to support their sons going to school, and there was a greater need among men for money-saving alternatives such as co-ops. Much less is known about the men's co-ops. The Depression wreaked havoc on the campus fraternities, leaving many houses empty. The housing market had bottomed out, and so people who were poor and yet wanted to go to um, college, they, they had an opportunity to get these buildings um, not uh, at, at a better rate than they might have in an earlier era and start up more housing cooperatives. The university bought some of these houses, and in September 1932, two men's co-ops similar to the women's co-ops already in existence were started. The following year, another house was bought, and together they formed a larger social organization called the Badger Club. Their total membership was 66 students then. By 1939, their numbers had grown to 125 men in five houses. Like the women's co-ops before it, Badger Club was as democratic as possible considering it had to answer to the UW Board of Regents. Officers were elected by each house and sat on the decision-making council of the Badger Club. Unlike the women's co-ops of the time, members received a patronage dividend at the end of the financial year. This was a way of divvying up any unspent money from the house budget. In 